Thank you, everyone. Let's go and start talking about club squatting. How many people he here we have as a defender? So I just like, you know, like we have one, okay, of, like offensive security people. Okay, majority offensive, so I will try to mix it up. So let's talk about today's menu. What do we have? So yeah, we're going to talk about the cloud like for a little bit. And we're going to talk about what's the problem like that we are facing at TikTok or like these big majors uh, companies that use the cloud to operate. And what did we do about it? That's the most important thing like for uh, like, like this talk. Then we're going to go and take people questions at the end of the talk. So yeah, just the usual. So who am I? So my name is Abdullah. I'm originally from Iraq. Um, I've been doing cybersecurity since I was 13. I started doing bug bounty stuff when I was 16. Then like one day, you know, like fast forward. Now I'm working as product security engineer at TikTok. So I'm based in London office. Um, yeah, like I don't want to go like, you know, for all the stuff that I want to talk about myself here. Let's just go directly to the... So everyone here, I hope, like knows what is the cloud. Right? Anyone like you know, not have an idea? That, that, that's okay. Um, so yeah, just like you know, back in the old day when you have to you know like when I use the internet, you just like have to do everything by yourself. And, you know, like connect to the internet. Like you know, you have a physical hardware and software and everything. But right now, like you just can like user can rent or subscribe to our resources and services from cloud providers, so that you don't have to do all these things. And it's become so popular these days because it offers civil advantages. So just like, you know, it's someone else's computer. Like, that's the cloud, like, uh, in a nutshell. So why would, like, someone use, like, other people, like, computers? That doesn't seem to be secure, actually. Like, if someone tells this to someone, like, they'd be like, why you are using this? So there's, like, so many advantages for this. Even for a big tech company, they are taking... Um, the advantage of these things, one of them is like on-demand resources. So if you want to like, you know, have um, a computer with different kind of capabilities, you can just uh, ask for it. Scalability, because, you know, like for, let's say you are in e-commerce, during Black Friday, there is like a huge spike. So like you have a lot of requests in very short time. And then like after that, it's going to like, you know, go down. And you don't want to like purchase like service or host, but it is very... Just like, you know, in case, so it's scale up and down is very easy with them. There's a lot of service models, like, you know, infrastructure as a service, like platform as a service and software as a service as well. Deployment models, like the public, the private, so it depends, like, if you want to, like, you know, work internally, like, or externally. And of course, the cost, so it's more, must like, efficient. You don't want to purchase, like, you know, hardware or software, or even, like, you know, have a host because it's going to cost you a lot. And it's accessible from all the world because, you know, these cloud provider, basically providers have, you know, data centers in all around the world. And security con compliance, like, you know, they are kind of secure. It was like, oh, what's this talk about then? If like everything is secure about the cloud. Well, just like a couple of, you know, bad luck, let's say. So what is the problem with this, like, cloud squatting? How many people here heard the term cloud squatting before? Okay, we have two, three, four. Okay, that's okay. Like quite a few, that's good. But this is going to be educational for the rest of people because I, for myself, when I joined TikTok, I didn't know what's this like term. Like I never heard about cloud squatting before. So when I actually looked through the term, like you know, cloud squatting, this is what I found on YouTube. I thought like it's going to be a talk or something. So I'm trying to change that. Like I've given a few talks about it. I hope like you know maybe the algorithm gonna make it up. Finger crossed. So this is actually what is the cloud squatting. It's like when organizations rent cloud servers, these servers get assigned an IP address. We're going to talk about IP address, like if you have no idea what is that. And customer connect to this IP address is like, you know, to send data. When the organization no longer uses the server, they can decide to be like this IP address is released, like reassigned to another user, maybe an evil one. So think about it like you just rented a flat and you like, you know, put in your bank account and other places like this address. You said, I'm like, you know, living in this place. This is my full address. And then like, you know, you just like moved from this place, but you forget all your like, you know, accounts still pointing to that address. So whenever like the bank statement like send you a message, like actually they're going to go to the old address, which might be like, you know, the new resident may be an evil one. He can read like, you know, your statements or your like private messages. Think about it like this is a simple way of it. 
So, you know, like the IP address is just a number, like it tells other computers where are you in the network. So we have this, like, you know, version of IP version 4. It looks like something like this. And the problem is that we have a limited number of it. So if you think about it, like we have IP version 4 and IP version 6, so this is like two numbers to tell like the network or like other computers where are you in the network. But the problem is if you look to the, so this is the address size, like look to the, like they have completely different address size. And the format is different, the notation as well. But this is what I'm like, you know, interested about is the number of addresses that you can have. So for IP version 4, which is like kind of, we kind of stuck in it. So there is like, you know, IP version 6 has been like here since a while. But we cannot just like jump to it. Also, there's a lot of advantages for it. But we still kind of stuck in IP version 4. And we have limited addresses when it comes to this. So number of addresses is like roughly 4 billions. But for, you know, like, it's just kind of like scarcity of like these numbers. And for like IP version 6, like, we don't have this problem anymore. Because this is like the long number that's going to take the whole day to read. Um, it's just like you can't give it to anyone. It's abandoned like in these addresses. Um, one thing I actually like, you know, kind of, this is kind of key part here. Anyone here like knows like what's the DNS or like, you know, I have to go deep inside it. Okay, I, I will assume everyone knows it. Um, it's just like, you know, like a phone book that tells like other, you know, computers or servers that this is the name of this IP address. So instead of having the number, you just have the name of the place because it's much easier for you to remember the the name instead of the like this weird number. So yeah, this is like kind of phone book, like has the name and the the number, basically. And there's like different type of DNS records. So this is kind of like centralized place when this, you know, like when you ask for these uh records. I'm gonna focus on um A records. But it could be like, you know, this vulnerability could like happen everywhere and other records as well. So here's like, you know, the basic thing. You ask for like the DNS server about what is the IP address of example.com. It will send you like the, the number. Your computer will use this number to connect to the web server and then you're going to exchange data. So yeah, let's talk about the examples of what is going on here. So think about it, like let's say TikTok wanted to use a cloud provider for like doing some project. And they used like this domain, like app.example.com. And um, like they register this domain, they make it point to this one, two, three, four, like this IP address, like that belongs to TikTok. But after a while, this like IP address, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, is like, it's not for TikTok actually, it's for like, let's say a cloud provider, AWS, GCP, or Azure. Let's say one year from now, like TikTok said, you know what, this project is not working out for us, we're just gonna remove it. So they deleted like, you know, or released this uh, IP address from there. It happens all the time with big tech companies that stuff, you know, pop up and deleted without nobody knows about it. Let's say like after one year later, someone actually like was trying to use AWS or any other cloud provider, and they got assigned this IP address. So think about it, like the DNS record is still pointing to this IP address that does not belong to TikTok anymore. So if we are sending data, if we are, you know, like pointing to this in anywhere, like they will be under like, you know, attacker control. Or even like one more thing, like we just also noticed that when we are kind of like, you know, coding stuff, this is very like a naive approach, but I'm just like giving it here for example. Let's say that you use this IP address to for logging or like different services, like, you know, other data that you are just pushing data to it. Um, and then, like, you just, like, you, you deleted this IP address from your use, like, let's say it's an EC2 or any other services that use a form of cloud provider. You deleted it, but all the code base is still pointing at it to send log, to send, like, you know, information and other things. And an extra thing, how many people here do bug bounty? Bug bounty hunters, okay, we have two, like, three, four, oh, that's good. So we got a lot of reports. Like when I joined TikTok, we were getting a lot of these reports all the time about subdomain takeover because of this issue. So basically we are using whatever like cloud provider and we deleted the assets and this IP address start dangling around. Someone just come like, you know, some something like brute force the assigning mechanism of the, this cloud provider or they just like keep re repeating the assigning process till they get this IP address and they start controlling a TikTok domain. 
an extension is that we have also this problem with, uh, not like with just a record, we have like, for example, with the CNAME record as well. So if you have like, for CNAME it's kind of the same thing, but instead of having an IP address, like a number, you just have a name. And this name also again points to your resor like resources. So when you delete it, this name is like will be released and anyone can register a bucket, like for example, on Amazon S3 with the same name and they're still having the, this control. So we put this, all these like, you know, kind of um, reports, like we categorize them, we did everything about it. Like, you know, like we can, uh, we want to understand like what's really going on. This is the same thing, like, you know, this, we, del we deleted the resource, someone actually found this name, registered it, and now they are controlling the blog.example.com. Very common sub, like, you know, subdomain takeover attack. So what did we do? We kind of like, you, you know, like we, it was my first project when I joined TikTok, like to work on this. So I just like gathered all the information and they said like the right course of action is to start researching the thing. Then we had a to-do list like about it. This is our to-do list. Um, so what did, do we need to collect here? So first we need our domains. That's the first thing that we're gonna, and um, second thing is, our IP addresses that belong to our cloud providers as well. And we need to know the cloud providers' IP ranges as well. I'm gonna explain why we need that. And third-party services that is vulnerable to take over attack, you know, like, uh, there are a lot of services, not just like cloud providers that is vulnerable to this kind of attack. We're gonna talk about it later on. So our domains, you know, when working, like, you know, maybe in a big tech company, there's like so many subdomains, so many like other domains for other services as well. And it happens to a lot of people, like, you know, they register domains without telling us like where this is, like, you know, being stored or something. So trying to, you know, like brute force it or finding like it was so hard. So, but then like eventually we just find like we have a kind of like, you know, our savior is like we have a centralized DNS records, like, you know, storage. So that was really good like that we had. And sometimes like, it also misses some of the domains that we are using because they are very created, like, you know, in different uh, pipeline or in different teams or different regions that they don't, like, use the same, um, let's say, DNS server or, like, DNS kind of records registration. So we had to go, like, to scan the code base for these instances, like, in configuration file and static files and other things as well. So we just like did that, like we finished the first one, we collected all our domains, now we have to go to the IP addresses that belong to cloud providers. How are we gonna find this? So it, it's there, like I'm talking about, like I, I think we use seven or eight cloud providers, I'm not sure about like that. And uh, there's like hundred or like maybe like hundred thousands like of them. So these like, you know, stuff like popping up, getting deleted all the time. So it's very hard to track as well. Then I found like actually we have two systems like, you know, uh, internally that we used to, they were not as kind of like, you know, ad hoc, so they were not designed to do, to solve this issue. But I found two systems that has all the data, like to have all the data that I need in this um, kind of like the IP addresses that by cloud provider. So they are also on another subsystem that's kind of like a third party, uh, int like integration kind of cloud thingy that is like establishing visibility or something like that. So it's not like what is dedicated to, but it has the data that we need. So yeah, our IP that belong to cloud providers. So using our, like Alto, it turns out like they are using the API for all the cloud providers that we are using to fetch data all the time. Like, you know, like say whenever we create something or do something, we, we use the, this API to get the data. So it has like integration with all the major and like, you know, and even like, you know, small cloud providers as well. Um, so yeah, like, and they provide, like, cloud providers actually uh, provide the API to do this thing, so that's, like, has been solved as well. And the subsystem that, you know, like, this type of visibility is not actually, like, it was for certain regions or things, so it doesn't have the whole data, and also as well, like, it doesn't have the whole data that we need to solve this issue. So we have to aggregate, like, the data from the two sources. So the problems that we face during this, like, doing this thing is that like data, re like redundancy, like because I said, like there are two resources, and like there is like a, so many records, like there's like a lot of duplication. So it like also it takes a while to remove all the duplication things, and since like things going and de getting deleted, updated, and things, it was kind of like hard to do. But I think it's like in the smaller, like you know, or mid, like small to medium sized companies, much easier to do that. 
And also there is kind of discrepancy between the data sources because, you know, like the data format, the, it's like someone say, actually, this belongs to us, like this says, like, it doesn't belong to us. So it took us a while also to tune, like, the results to make sure that we are doing the right thing. So, okay, we kind of solved two things here, like our domains and um, our IP addresses that belong to cloud provider. Now we need the ranges. Why do we need the ranges? I will tell you because we, when we have an IP address, we don't know like what, what's the resource. Sometimes like it doesn't mention in these, re, this, like you know the resources that we use to collect the IP address. It doesn't tell you which cloud provider is act. This is like we just say like we got this. It's like from a cloud provider. I don't know what is the cloud provider that have this IP address. So we went out and we found all the IP ranges, like you know kind of the prefixes for the subnets for these um, IP, and then we have to basically. Uh, match it, like with the IP address that we have. So with the cloud providers, there's like a number of subnets. So like for AWS, I think is the most common, like, you know, used one is like they have 7,000 something GCB less. I sure too many, but I don't know why. Um, Yandex, they have 13. Alibaba has like as many as well. So it's very hard to collect. So just like, you know, like this is kind of, I don't want to go to this to network kind of thing. So if you want to know, like, if this IP address like actually belong to this subnet, you just do this, and then it's much easier to tell. Um, there's like a lot of libraries, but it's a very easy thing to do manually. So this is what we did, basically. So the problems that we face during doing this, there is no formal format for these files. So the files that we are, like, you know, these cloud providers actually like provide to, to tell you like what, what subnets belong to them. So there is no formal format for it. So GCB using some format, AWS using another format. And for the others, like, you know, like another problem is that you need to keep up, up to date with them because they, you know, like respawn different um, subnets all the time or delete like a few of them. So you have to always like keep up to date with, with all these things. Not all providers have JSON list. So uh, quite a few providers, they don't have it like, you know, this JSON file. They just tell you this is an HTML page and there's a table inside it. And in this table, okay, we have this ranges and you have to go figure it out by yourself. So also you need to make a way that you reach this, parse it and get it into the, to the worker that's going to work on fetching this data. Okay. So. For third-party services, that is vulnerable to take over attacks. So we talked about, um, like, like you know, the EC2 and other like things. But it's also there is like this issue of using WordPress or other services that is vulnerable to this. So it took me a while to research the whole thing, and apparently there's so many of them. There is a list on um, GitHub that has all these vulnerable. Sometimes it like, like it's not um, there is like maybe something vulnerable, but you don't find it here. But most of it is like up to date. So using this fingerprint, you can actually know if this, this, like, you know, this service is vulnerable or not. And you have also to keep up to date with. So now we have everything from our list. We don't have to worry about like, you know, data collection. It like takes like so long to do this, especially like, you know, as I said, you need to like a lot of approvals and a lot of people like to you know, onboard them to, like, uh, to give you this access. So the workflow, like, basically, we had our DNS records, our systems, like, you know, that we were collecting data from. So we basically went and w send it to data preparation. Then, like, you know, we took, like, we send it to data analyzing and then with the communication to give the results of these things. And this is running all the time, by the way. So for data preparation, we just pull data from the, the sources that I told you about, then remove duplication. So if there's any duplication between IP addresses, domains, and other things, we just like remove it. For analyzing, so we're gonna, what we're gonna do is like basically we iterate through our domains, like we have the domains and we have their like, you know, um, uh, correspondence, like, you know, IP addresses that are assigned to them. So if the domain has a vulnerable C name, send in it, like let's say we said we talked about like services that have this um, vulnerable C name that someone can register. So if it's like, you know, if it is like has a vulnerable C name, we're going to send a request, an HTTP request, 
depends on like you know what kind of stuff actually like because some of them is just like you know dead like so they don't have they're not going to respond and so it took us a while to fingerprint many of them to tell if this is vulnerable or not so you send like an http or ideas request to find like the fingerprint that we talked about before from the github and some of them we actually added it manually so if the domain has like that's one one aspect. The other aspect is that if the domain has an IP that belongs to a cloud provider, how did we know? We took the domain, found the IP addresses, and from the IP, we matched it against the subnets from all the cloud providers. It's going to take a while to do that, if you, especially if you have a lot of IP addresses. But since it's like you know running all the time, um, it's not going to be an issue. So if it has like an IP address, the cloud check if it's in our records. Okay, like, so we're gonna go, like, to the, to the database. We're gonna say, okay, this is belong to a, a cloud provider. Do we have it in our control? So the worst case scenario, no, is like, it's not in, uh, under our control. So, like, someone can assign this and get data out of it. Um, the second thing, it, it, what if it's in under our control, but it's not registered anywhere in these systems? It's also something we need to worry about because it means that this is not an under, like, you know, under our firewalls and not under our, you know, logging or whatever. So it's also we need to keep like an eye on this, even if it's not vulnerable to the attack that we talked about. It's still vulnerable to something else, or like you know, maybe we're gonna need it in the future. So we're gonna report this anyway to to the one who. So it's gonna be. I'm gonna talk about the communication later on. So I don't want to go now. Um, like yeah. So another one is that we talked about like domains, but what if we are actually having this in configuration files, for example? So it's, it's, there's no domain name. It's just like an IP address that you are using to send data. So we're going to iterate through IPs as well. If the IP is expired, check. Like if we are using it in any code or configuration file, we're going to go through the code base searching for this. And we also have like a very well, like, um, let's say, very good logging for kind of our code base. So, and you can search very fast on it. So that's also like a very important thing if you want to utilize this. And for the communication, so we're just going to send an alert to a channel. So we have Lark, like internally. It's like just a Slack alike kind of system. You can use a Slark email or other things. We send it to the resource owner. So if it's a domain, like say, you know, like um, this domain belongs to you is actually pointing to an out, like you know, an IP address that's not an, under our control. If it's an IP address, like you know, has been mentioned in the code base, we're going to go to the like code owner, like you know, the repo owner, and say you are pointing to uh, an IP address that doesn't belong to us, so you have to remove it as well. And it's like we get an email for, for us as a security engineers because, you know, like people getting pinged, like sometimes they just like, yeah, I don't know what is this, so I will just ignore it. So you have to keep an eye on them and you just like, you know, remind them that this is, it could be like really dangerous. So this is what the system looks like at the moment. So we have workers like do all these things. So the first worker is actually getting the data from the like Alto and third party that we are using to get all the IP addresses that belong to a cloud, like, you know, that we are actually using. They're going to put it in the database and also worker two going to go to scan the uh, code base for f trying to find domains and for Desco as well to, Desco is like this DNS, um, like centralized kind of storage. Then, like, Worker 4 are going to do, like, the fetching from the, we talked about, you know, like, these files and other cloud provider ranges that's going to, like, keep to fetch them all the time. Worker 3, if, like, you know, all these things, like, you know, happened, and we, when we talked about, like, uh, we talked about the, these two things, like, the analyzing part, if it's actually, like, you know, raise an alarm, the Worker 3 will send um, our message to our Lark bot. So it's a bot, like, basically, you can do a Slack bot as well, so it's not, not the problem here. And we have an API as well to, con like you know, connect to this system and do things with it. So, how are you going to build this? How much time do we have left? Oh wow, man! Like I have to slow down. Like, okay, like it's actually lunchtime, so it's better to release you like sooner. So yeah, like how are you going to build the system by yourself? So it depends on what are you trying to achieve. Let's say you are, for example, actually someone who works at a company and think about it to how to build this thing. Because you think, oh, it's like TikTok, it's like a big company, they have this. But it happens for everyone. It's like I've, I've seen a lot of cases for other companies, like small, medium, and big companies that sharing this problem. As long as you are using the cloud, you're going to like 
maybe do this mistake eventually. So if you are, let's say, a bug bounty hunter, like it's different from, like, if you have auxiliary, all this data. So your domain management. So if you are actually a company and you want to have, like, access to your domain, you can, like, look to your, you know, domain management and grab this data. But if you are, like, let's say, a bug bounty hunter and you want to, like, do the, find this issue in other companies, you just can scrape the data and brute force the subdomains and have, like, basically um, a list of all these domains that you're going to check, it, you know, like, um, over time. Check for for CNAME takeover with tools. Like, yeah, this is very obvious one. There is, like, so many tools that does check this. Um, if it's vulnerable or not, you can add, like, you know, integrate it into the to your workflow as well. Check if an IP address is not alive. So this is kind of tricky. Like sometimes you send like a ping and it, or like an HTTP request and it's, it actually fails, but you can, when you go to this, like, you know, when you visit this in the browser, it's going to pop up because I think, yeah, many of maybe firewall rules or something dropping the ICMB of the ping. And you need to automate everything because I just said, like, these things, you know, like um, happen overnight or like every few minutes, like, you know, because there's like time zones and things that people starting doing this, deleting this. So it's better to automate everything because you don't want to do this manually. It's going to take you forever. Um, but it's like, yeah, if you automate this, you can find a lot of good reports. So for references, we, like I use these references to actually, you know, like assemble this um, slides. So I'm just going to give them the credit here. So yeah, like we we kind of finished like earlier on because yeah, like I think I didn't do the time management right, but it's good timing. Like so, you can you know set you free for lunch. So we have questions. Anyone like you know interested? And in, yeah, okay, we have one here, one here. Hmm. Thanks for the talk. Thanks for the talk. Appreciate that. Um, two uh, step question I have. Um, one thing is you, in the examples, you only mentioned uh, IPv4 addresses. I guess you also use IPv6 addresses, or don't you? Sorry, can you repeat the question? The examples you gave yeah. were IPv4 addresses. So I guess uh, TikTok uh, uses also IPv6 addresses, or don't they? Uh, we don't, like most of the time, actually. So this is the problem with this... Um, like, you know, like, thing with... We use it in some places. Okay. But most of our systems are running on IP version 4. Ah, okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, the second part of the question doesn't make sense then. Okay, thank Why? you. <laughs> like, uh, you well, I can ask. Well, mm. I was wondering whether IPv6 addresses make it easier or uh, more difficult if you would uh, use them. Because you can throw away addresses and they won't be reused, reused probably. That, that's true, yeah. Like, so if IP version 6 start being used, like, this is going to be, like, dead because there's abundance of, uh, it's a very good question. So, like, yeah, if we use IP version 6, we're not going to have the problem of scarcity, like, for IP addresses. So you can create it, like, you know, and forget about it because I think you can assign, like, an IP, like, version 6 for every atom in the universe and you're not going to run out of addresses. I'm not sure about this information. Don't use it in any scientific paper. Um, but yeah, so like you know, we're not gonna have this problem anymore. But it's very hard to you know like to go to IP version six. There's so many problems and challenges. We are kind of this is a problem of decentralized system. Like you know, everyone's using IP version four, so yeah. you are kind of like you know stuck or locked with like the e current ecosystem. Well, the protocol is uh, only 26 years old, so it's rather new. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, I, I, that's the thing. Like with decentralized system, trying to. Uh, you know, upgrade. It's like one of the disadvantages. Like, you know, if you try to update, like, to IB version 6, like, there's a lot of people or, you know, system that, so, like, not, like, can't handle this. So, oh, yeah, I'm not, like, sure that we're going to start using it anytime soon. Okay. So this is going to be, you know, for, like, in, in the market for a while. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you. Oh, more questions over there. Thanks for the talk. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to listen. 
this information from stage. Uh, I have a few questions too. Uh, did you try to go to use the Go Buster from the asset now released multiple years ago? Because this story happened mostly because of the bug hunters. The researcher from Sweden discovered that issue six years ago. He noted from the stage about this, and at least five people started like mining the IP addresses from cloud providers and match it with the bug bounty table list of the domains that they have, and that's how they match like the exact domains. Um, so, and one of the company actually and the researcher company uh, released the the service GoBuster that is literally connecting to your cloud providers with the cloud accounts that you have. And it's like kind of mitigating for you all the things that you mentioned here. Did you try to use it? Are there any impediments was there? Uh, and that's why you didn't use it at all? Okay. I'm not sure. Maybe like we've been through it. When was that? Sorry. Like the, when it was released? Oh, like that's quite popular, I would say. Like, yeah, I, I heard the name like GoBuster, but I'm not sure if they the, the Shoops with... released this, the, the Shoops. Yeah, yeah, I know. Notes. I think it's like only for AWS. No, it's supporting multiple cloud providers. And yeah, we, actually, we actually implement this in house. And like, I was curious about listening, haven't seen anything about mention about this. Yeah, actually, like, I don't think so. When I searched this problem, like, I think like, yeah, I, I came to one of these tools that we're using, like, you know, finding EC2, actually, I think. Uh, but I'm not sure, like, I think there was problems with the implementation or like, you know, like for the access or like the tokens, because here's the thing, you cannot ask, I, this is one thing about that, it was the data kind of access level, because they don't want to give you, this is like for the two system that they basically gave us an API, they didn't want to give us the credential for the, for the cloud providers, that's one thing. The second thing is that we use like so many cloud providers that, and there's like accounts for everyone, so we cannot just like, you know, ask for every one of them to actually, you know, like give us your credential because we're gonna search this. So the, the like data, like, you know, kind of fetching or pulling was not our kind of, you know, like uh, out of our control. So we depended on this system to do this, like, you know, getting this data. Maybe if we have this like credential, we can, it's much easier like just to integrate it into a tool, but you have so many users, like, and I'm talking about thousands of thousands of developers that using these services, so it's like very hard to keep track of all these things. Um, that's like one, maybe one aspect of we, why we didn't use a tool like such as that. I'm, I'm not really sure about if it covers all the cases because I tell you like we are using maybe eight cloud providers. So even depending on, and here's also another thing is that I find it like interesting with open source that you know like tools come and die all the time. So you don't want to be like reliant on outside like kind of tools. Yeah, it makes sense, but like not from the people that released this tool actually. Uh, but anyway, like it's mm. what I heard, it's mostly about the organization problem to to use this tool properly with the configured root accounts from the cloud, and because of the some concerns, I would say from the security point of view. Okay, uh, another question: Do you think that that problem came from the bug hunters at all? Because like me as a bug hunter and working as a defender, I'm sitting with these reports from time to time and thinking like. Is it really possible from the black hats to do this work? Because most of the back hunters kind of catching this on a fly in a way when they really abusing the cloud systems, mining the IP addresses and matching with the map of the uh, bug, hunt, bug bounty <coughs> tables, lists where the company could pay. From my point of view as a bug hunter and the defender, um, I don't really believe that black hats could, could do this work that way because for for the black hats it's cheaper and easier to like buy the credentials from the stolen um logs uh of the user or malware the user or like abuse the some systems but not on that like research way to to pick the target and the maximum impact will be like subdomain takeover and like what the maximum you could do with subdomain takeover maybe account takeover but you need to create the chain and like it's really questionable like is it the problem from the, from the back hunters? What do you think? Okay, yeah, that's such a good question. It has multi layers, so let's go first talking about. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of get risen to our kind of attention with like you know like bug bounty reports. We basically put more effort into it because it's a very common theme that people report this issue, and we said okay, since a lot of people are finding this, let's just go and do more work on it. And for the 
Black Hat, so here's the thing. You, you Let's say you have a file like, you know, being used at TikTok.com. And it's like, um, let's say, a JS file that has been embedded at TikTok.com. And this like um, domain belongs to one of the providers and got deleted and now it's like returning 404 or whatever. And then someone like, you know, like notice that you cannot like know the intention of this person. So if it's a black hat, if it's like a white hat, maybe like the white hat are more like, you know, active when it comes to this. But you cannot just assume like, you know, if you are like, if I showed up with a meeting with my manager and I told him like, no, nobody, a black hat will, you know, like black hat, black hat hacker will use this against us. It's a bad, like, you know, it's like when you assume, you assume the worst always. You say this IP address will fall into, you know, like, uh, let's say, um, let's say if there's like groups or like, you know, people trying to attack TikTok or other organization as well. So I think the assumption here is that you say like only like, uh, white hat hackers do that. Actually, everyone does that. So we can never tell who's like, you know, the intention. So we, we're going to solve it anyway. And it's going to also, if we are thinking about bug bounty thing, you are paying a lot of money for these instances. Like, so, if you have like, you know, 500 domains that's, you know, exploitable, you're going to, you know, like multiply by, I don't know, 1,000 or like, you know, 500 depends on the bounty that you're going to receive. So on, on larger scale, it's important and think about it as well from the, let's say there is like a startup or, you know, like a service that is being used. And it's like they bankrupt or whatever and still like, you know, these old companies sending data to it. So if someone just like, you know, make a listener about the data that they are receiving, they just can get a lot of data that's not like should, like should not get it. So it's not a bug bounty kind of thing because there is no bounty at all. Like, you know, in these companies, they just like, you know, someone want to harvesting data from them. Makes yeah, sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And the last question, do you think that's, that problem could be eliminated from the cloud providers at all? Because like third party services, SaaS and mm. others, they, checking you if you want to use this abandoned subdomain again, for example. And as you mentioned, like, can I uh, take over XYZ? They have the table. It's not really up to date, I would say, because there is a lot of, like, workarounds how you can take the subdomain again and again. But most of the cloud providers, SaaS providers, they're checking right now, are you the owner of that service? Do, can you, like, own this? But nothing at all. Uh, about this and the cloud provider itself, like AWS, GCP, and etc. Do you think it's something could be implemented here? Because like the people just mining the IP addresses and matching with the with the domains, like. So I've I've read like a, like a while ago that there are some measurements to prevent you from reassigning like so many IP addresses, so you cannot just like do it like you know on milliseconds or like I mean like you know on seconds trying to brute force. So they try to, but at the end of the day. The problem is that how you can do it, like, you know, like it's an IP address that is like they actually, this is kind of their business model. So if you think about it, I just, I give the example of renting a flat. So, you know, the flat owner cannot say, you know, like I'm not, this was like a previous tenant, like, you know, here, I'm not going to rent this anymore. This is their business model. And it's kind of like the mistake of the one who's used this IP address. I don't think they can eliminate this without using IP version 6. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Any questions? Okay, then we are done. Thank you for attending. Mm.